Hello everybody, welcome back to another week. Today we are taking a look at Moritz Schlick's On the Meaning of Life. So we are entering into our last full week of content here. Uh, we're going to see today in, in Schlick and tomorrow in Richard Taylor's piece, what I'm dubbing the subjective view of the meaning of life. So we're gonna see for both Schlick and Taylor, really what it is to lead a meaningful life is to lead a life characterized by uh, certain sorts of, of activities uh, defined by how they are viewed by the individual or subject. So one thing we heard from Edwards and something we've seen from some other people is that when we're talking about the meaning of life, there are questions about how we feel about things, but then there are also some other questions such as whether or not there are any um, values being integrated in a certain sort of way. So Edwards has this in when uh, uh, he's distinguishing between the subjective and, and objective meaning of life. Uh, of course, when we're looking at theistic answers, we see some of the, the thinkers there talking about having some sort of objective value or significance or purpose being part of uh, the, the plan or um, thought process in a way of some sort of greater being. We're gonna see for Schlick and Taylor, uh, really it's all about the individual subject. So we'll hear the, the details of both of their views on that um, between today and tomorrow. And then we'll turn to Keeks and Wolf uh, later this week where they, they certainly appreciate that aspect, that, that subjective aspect having certain sorts of feelings or attitudes towards what we're doing. Uh, but they also want to reintroduce, sort of like Edwards, but putting a little bit more emphasis on it, something like a moral dimension or, or something more. So um, we're gonna see in Schlick and Taylor this subjective approach, it's really an individual approach and, and whether or not a life is meaningful really depends on how the individual leading it is going to assess it and, and live it. We're gonna see in Keeks and Taylor that they're going to take that in one hand and say, yeah, there's something right about that, but it's not a complete picture. It's not the, the total story to have about what it is that makes a life meaningful. There's gotta be something more to it. So we'll see them later this week. And that's going to be this week's content. And then uh, next week, we just have Monday and, and just a couple of pieces there really looking at this question, you know, what's the meaning of life or this topic uh, and and really assessing whether or not it's a good question to be asked. So we'll see that then. So Schlick himself was a uh, 19th into 20th century thinker, so maybe we should really just call him a, a 20th century uh, German physicist philosopher. Um, he was sort of the leader of this Vienna circle of, of logical positivists. Um, really influential movement in the uh, 1920s, 30s in, in Vienna, before, of course, um, people associated with it sort of broke up and tried to leave Germany and, and Austria uh, with the rise of the Nazis. Now, Schlick himself was shot and killed in 1936, um, basically by a, a former student who was a Nazi sympathizer. Um, and, and so far as I know, nothing really ever came of it. I'm fairly certain the student was acquitted and everything. So Schlick himself was really, um, his life was ended by the rise of the Nazi regime and, and his opposition to it. And we've seen other thinkers through this course, um, you know, Fackenheim, Bayer, uh, being impacted by that historical movement as well and winding up in, in different parts of the world, such as Toronto or Australia as a result. Okay, so what are we gonna see in this piece out of Schlick? So first, a little bit of a discussion of Schopenhauer. Uh, he also talks a bit about Nietzsche. We haven't really taken a direct look at Nietzsche in this course, but he's been echoed by a few different people. Um, Schlick, we're gonna see, thinks that Schopenhauer is correct if we think life's meaning rests in some sort of, of purpose or goal to be achieved. Uh, in that case, then Schopenhauer is right that life is going to be painful or boring and ultimately it's, it's going to wind up being meaningless. Schlick further argues that not only, not only is Schopenhauer right if that's how we see the meaning of life, but he holds that modernity, so really you know, the industrialized world of late 19th into the, the early 20th century, um, 
that modern world really promotes meaninglessness because it promotes uh, living life according to purposes. And when we do that, Schopenhauer is correct. So Schluck has, in some sense, a very scathing assessment of modernity compared to earlier time periods. Now, of course, he might be romanticized in the past, but we're going to hear a little bit about what he has to say there. He does think our lives, lives can have meaning in play, as he defines it. We're going to see he's got special senses of work and play that he um, uses here. And he ultimately concludes that the meaning of life is youth. Uh, we're going to see, even there, when he's talking about youth, he, be, he talks about youth in, in the normal sense, right? Being young, being of a young age. But he also talks about being um, young or youthful as having a certain kind of mindset. So he's got a special sense of youth as well as special senses of work and play that he deals with. So we're going to see what those are because they're important to understand his definitions of those terms to really get what he's trying to say here. Okay, so let's get into it. So to start with uh, looking at his assessment of Schopenhauer, uh, he really, you know, the start of his piece, he opens with this, he says, Man sets himself goals, and while he is heading towards them, he is buoyed up by hope. Indeed, but not at the same time by the pain of unsatisfied desire. Once the goal is reached, however, after the first flush of triumph has passed away, there follows inevitably a mood of desolation. A void remains, which can seemingly find an end only through the painful emergence of new longings, the setting of new goals. So the game begins anew. An existence seems doomed to be a restless swing to and fro between pain and boredom, which ends at last in the nothingness of death. That is the celebrated line of thought which Schopenhauer made the basis of his pessimistic view of life. Is it not possible somehow to escape? We're going to see that Schlick ultimately says, yes, we can escape this, this line of, of thinking or this, this way of existing that Schopenhauer described. But Schlick doesn't merely think Schopenhauer is, is just plain wrong. It's not just that you know, Schopenhauer overemphasizes the negative aspects of life. Rather, Schlick thinks if we really try to live our life in a certain kind of way, if we allow ourselves uh, to have our, our attitudes towards our lives and what we do, uh, to, to be influenced and really set by uh, a certain culture or, and, and I don't mean sort of, you know, Canadian culture or something like that, but rather a, a, there's a certain kind of mindset that Schlick thinks if you take that on, really you wind up succumbing to Schopenhauer's view, you really wind up with this, this pessimistic view of life, um, which itself, just given a few other things Schlick says, particularly closer to the end of the piece, might put you then in a position where you really feel like life needs some kind of redemption. Uh, that, and, and this was a connection that Edwards made as well, that there is some kind of similarity underlying at least certain um, pessimistic views of life, such as, say, Schopenhauer's, and at least certain um, religious approaches to life, say, such as Tolstoy's. That one way to view earthly life is as something that is not really worth itself, it's not uh, particularly pleasant or meaningful or complete, and thus is in need of something more to make it valuable, to make it worthwhile, and so on. Note, I'm not saying this accurately characterizes all religious dispositions. But this is something that both Edwards and, and Schluck put their finger on, and I think if you uh, pay attention to the way earthly life is described by certain um, religious thinkers, there is this strain in there. Just, you know, taking a look at Tolstoy, he comes to see life, earthly life, as worthless, it's not valuable, uh, there's, no, there's no reason to engage in it unless there's something more, right? Unless there's the infinite, unless there's God, or whatever exactly it is, Tolstoy's pretty open-ended on this. Uh, there, there's no difference between going through your life and living the whole thing or just killing yourself right now, right? Uh, it all amounts really to nothing. So, who cares? Schlick thinks if we take this particular kind of attitude towards life, you know, we focus on goals, then Schopenhauer is going to be right. Ultimately, we're going to be unhappy. Why? Well, it's really because as long as we are fixated on goals, as long as we have that sort of purpose-driven mindset, which as we've been moving through the course, we've seen some other 
thinkers on the meaning of life seem to assume in the background, and I've tried to point this out in, in some of the pieces we've been looking at, that some of the people we've been looking at, some of the, the non-theistic thinkers, really seem to connect meaning in life to goals, projects, tasks. Um, it's about, in some sense, accomplishments is how they seem to be characterizing the meaning of life. We're going to see, really, in this piece uh, and, and in Taylor's piece tomorrow, really a scathing review of that kind of approach. Right? Schlick says, as long as we're focused on, on tasks, on, on goals, purposes like that, really we are stuck with Schopenhauer because while we're striving towards the goal, we are uh, really, you know, pushed by this sense of, of, you know, we haven't finished yet, that we've got this something more to do. There are, are sort of pains involved in trying to reach a goal. Uh, there's, there's a struggle for it. But then once we achieve the goal, just like Schopenhauer says, we get at least a temporary satisfaction of that, you know, we feel fulfilled or, or happy or whatever it might be. Um, we don't have that sense of, of purpose or, or goal hanging over us. But quickly, the pleasurable feeling fades away, that happiness, that sense of accomplishment fades into the background, and quickly either we get bored if we don't set ourselves new tasks, new goals to pursue, or we, uh, so, you know, we get bored if we don't have a new one, or we set ourselves new tasks, new goals, and in the pursuit of those, we again pick up those feelings of, of stress, and pain, and struggle, and so on, and so we find ourselves in this perpetual cycle. Either it's pain or boredom. So one or the other. Um, and, and just, you know, an, an example of that, um, I was doing my PhD, you know, taking some years, it's this great big thing you go through. In a lot of ways, it's much like doing, uh, you know, an undergraduate degree, though it's a little bit less guided, right? It, it took me four years. Um, instead of just sort of doing coursework, there's some coursework, and then you go on and basically have to write a book. Uh, and so it's this big, long process. It's this big, huge goal with all these little sub goals. And it was, you know, at the time, uh, one of the greatest achievements of my life, right? And when it was finished, I was so happy and satisfied and had this real sense of achievement and so on. And that faded fairly quickly, right? Uh, within, hmm, I, I'm not sure if it was sort of a few weeks or, or maybe even lasted a couple of months or something, but within a relatively short amount of time. You know, a much shorter amount of time than it took to actually complete the, the goal. Um, the feeling faded and it was like, okay, well, what now? Right? What's, what's the next task or goal? What's the next thing to pursue? And this is something that Schlick is talking about here, and I'm talking about my own experience just in part to, to share. Whenever we have that goal-fixated mindset, uh, once we achieve whatever the big goal is, quickly that fades and, and new goals get set. So on um, this particularly, I, I think captures the experience of going through a long process like doing a degree or getting some sort of professional certificate or something uh, rather well. You can spend years and years um, working towards becoming a, you know, a teacher or an academic or an engineer or a lawyer or, or and all sorts of other things that I'm just not even mentioning here. All of these very long intensive uh, you know, projects that have this goal, you know, I want to become a whatever, this, this sort of person, I want this sort of career. It takes a long time to achieve it, and there is certainly a sense of accomplishment once you get there, but then really what's, what's the result? A whole new lifetime of projects and goals to be pursued, and, and in some sense, very quickly, all of that work and that, that toil that went into achieving the initial goal gets uh, not, not lost entirely, but certainly it sort of disappears into the past. So Schlick thinks really Schopenhauer's right that if we're looking, in, uh, looking for the meaning of life in purposes, then we're going to be trapped between pain and boredom. And life is going to sort of swing between those two things. Pain is we're trying to reach our goals, and once we reach them, we're going to quickly get bored. Not only is Schopenhauer correct that if we um, try to seek the meaning of life in purposes, ultimately our answer is going to be there really isn't one. But Schlick uh, further adds that the present 
right? The, you know, here he is writing, um, not, it's 100-ish years after Schopenhauer. We'll put it that way. It's not even quite right. The, the piece we read from Schopenhauer wasn't even 100 years before that. Um, Schlick says, you know, the present idolizes work. And what is work? It's really a kind of goal-seeking activity. It's purpose-driven. So Schlick gives us this particular definition of work. So, uh, and it's, right, is this what everybody means by work when they talk about work? Not necessarily, but it's also not a complete perversion of the word. It's not like he took the word work and redefined it to mean book, right? I have some good work here. It's like, no, well, okay, I guess that sort of works. Ah, oh, right, here we go. Uh, <laughs> that, that definition or that use of language might be okay, given that my current work, the thing I'm consuming a lot of my time with is working through this text, and there's another sense of work, with you. Uh, but what Schlick is doing is giving a certain meaning to this word. Are right? saying, oh, okay, I know a lot of people might mean a lot of, of slightly different things by work. One very popular understanding of the term work, and I'm sure if I bothered to look this up on a dictionary before I started this, I would find this in there somewhere. Uh, you know, work is some sort of activity you get paid for, you get compensated for. So of course, my teaching you here is a kind of work, I get compensated for it. But Schlick says, okay, I don't wanna focus on the compensation aspect. I don't want to focus on, I don't want to define work in terms of what you get for doing something. Rather, instead, he wants to define work as any activity undertaken solely in order to realize some purpose. So, just taking that definition, something qualifies as work if it's done just for the result it gets you. And so, when we think back to that instrumental and intrinsic value distinction that I've made a few times in the course, we made it quite early on and, and it's stuck with us here. Uh, work is really any activity that is only instrumentally valuable. Something can be both intrinsically and instrumentally valuable, right? Say working out, if you enjoy doing it for its own sake, right? That you just find that a pleasurable, rewarding kind of activity. It can be instrumentally valuable or intrinsically valuable. But of course it can also be instrumentally valuable assuming you do it both because of, of you know just the enjoyment you get out of doing it, but also for say the health benefits. Right? So something can be both, or it can be just one or the other or nine. Right? Something can lack value entirely. Right? Something can be just intrinsically valuable. You just like doing it for its own sake, but it doesn't really get you anything else. Right here, I I think about say watching, um, you know, certain movies that I don't find particularly enriching, but you know it's not like they they make me a smarter or better person, but it's just kind of brain candy. Um, or, you know, games of a certain sort, right? Playing board games or video games or something like that. Um, you know, what, are, are they giving me any instrumental value in my life? Sort of, you know, do they make me money or anything? No, uh, but I just enjoy engaging in them, right? Work is something that's purely instrumentally valuable. This is really what Schlick's telling us. For something to qualify as work, it's the kind of thing you do merely for the results, right? In which case, it could certainly just be compensation. Work is something you do um, when you get paid for it. That, uh, at least some of the time, Schlick would say, yes, that meaning of work or, or the sorts of activities we would classify as work under that definition of work would also qualify as work under my definition, but not all of the time. Right? So, um, We've got this particular definition of work, and, and Schlick says, you know, the present idolizes work, right? It idolizes um, engaging in activities that are, are purpose-driven, right? You know, uh, increase the economy, increase output. You know, we typically measure the sort of health of a country through GDP, and of course, with you know our current pandemic situation, uh, there are all these, uh, you know economic impacts, which are very real. So, you know, I'm not trying to underplay that as like, oh yeah, right, it's all overblown or anything like that. Look, there are very real economic impacts. Um, it's not like um, you know, money and resources don't matter. I think anybody who, who says that either has a, a very sort of particular view on what sorts of things matter or are valuable, or is really speaking from a position of affluence, right? It's, it's when you have these sorts of things, it's very easy to say like, oh yeah, I'm sure people can be happy without them. So I, I you know, 
we don't need any sort of redistributive scheme or any sort of effort to make sure people have uh, not an equal share of resources, but at least some kind of equitable share, right? That, that people can get more resources, they can get more money if they want it, uh, if they you know, make certain sorts of choices and uh, work hard. So Schlick says, um, you know, the president idolizes work. Uh, most people, if asked, are going to say that they work to maintain their life, right? Like, why, why do you engage in this work, right? Why is it idolized? Why does it matter so much, right? Well, minimally, um, to maintain our life, right? To, to um, buy groceries, to have, have a place to live and so on. Um, but, Schlick says, there's, there's a problem here. We're really interested in, in value and, and meaning, right? Mere living, he says. Right, just staying alive. And so there's a lot of Camus in here as well, right? Mere living, pure existence as such, is certainly valueless. It must also have content. And in that only can the meaning of life reside. But what actually fills up our days almost entirely is activities serving to maintain life. In other words, the content of existence consists in the work that is needed in order to exist. We are therefore moving in a circle, and in this fashion fail to arrive at a meaningful life. So when we think about that, uh, you know, this, this um, analysis Schlick is giving us not quite 100 years ago, but it's getting awfully close. Actually, now that I think of it, I think this piece was written in the 1920s. I'm gonna check this very quickly. Um, I'm, I'm starting to have that experience where time sort of slips by. Uh, and I keep thinking it's 15 or 20 years ago uh, because I don't want it to be getting older. Uh, yeah, this was um, originally published 1927, so it's, you know, not quite 100 years old, but it's getting close. Um, I think Schlick's analysis we could apply, you know, very much today as well. A lot of people work a lot, right? Uh, you know, the majority of their, their waking hours, the time they have energy and enthusiasm and excitement, or at least could, are taken up by work, right? Engaging in paid labor of some sort, why? To you know, meet necessities, to pay for a place to live, to have food, to send their children to school, to have clothes, to you know, have transportation to get to work. Uh, there's this interesting circle where you have to spend a whole lot of time working to be able to afford the things you need to be able to keep going on work. Right? You've got to work a bunch to afford a vehicle that you can use to then drive to the place where you work, which means you have to spend more time at the place you work in order to have the transportation to get there, right? It's this, it's this cycle almost. Um, Schlick says if, if that's what we're doing, uh, in some sense we're, we're really in trouble because as he says, the characteristic mark of work is that it has its purpose outside itself and is not performed for its own sake. The doctrine that would wish to install work as such at the center of existence and exalted a life's highest meaning is bound to be an error because every work activity as such is always a mere means and receives its value only from its goals. So, um, as I was mentioning before, uh, oh, sorry. Um, for Schleck, work is only instrumentally valued, right? Not intrinsically valued. And exactly what Schlick is pointing out here is that whatever gives life meaning has to be something that is intrinsically valuable. Because as long as we're stuck in a cycle of instrumentally valuable things, we're actually looking for the value. For something to be instrumentally valuable, that just means really it really gets us to something that's valuable in itself. And so if we trace a line uh, through work activities, ultimately we either come to nothing or something that's intrinsically valuable. Because the something that's intrinsically or instrumentally valuable is only actually valuable because of what it eventually gets you. If it's supposed to be instrumentally valuable, but never actually gets you to something that's intrinsically valuable and something valuable on its own, for its own sake, then really the instrumentally valuable thing wasn't valuable at all, right? It might have been valuable if it got you to something intrinsically valuable, but it's only valuable if it really does. So. I've given this example before. Say you, you take a trip somewhere solely for the purpose of achieving something, right? You, I don't know, you've got a medical appointment in Calgary. 
you don't particularly want to go to Calgary, right? You don't enjoy your, your car. You don't want to go for the car ride. There are other things you'd rather do with your day. But you make the trip up there, right? You spend two or three hours, say, driving up to Calgary to go to this appointment. You arrive there only to find out that the doctor is sick and has canceled all their appointments for the day, but nobody called you. Nobody informed you of this fact. So you have no reason to be there. And you turn around and go home. And you've just spent four or, or perhaps five hours, right? doing something you didn't want to do for a purpose that wasn't achieved. There's no value in the ride there. So Schlick gives us this definition of work and says, look, as long as we think the meaning of life is somehow uh, located in work, Schopenhauer's right. There really isn't a meaning. Life is going to be uh, um, pointless, right? It's not going to be worth it. So it has to be something intrinsically valued. Now, of course, Schopenhauer being so utterly sort of negative, so, well, nothing's really that worth it, right? Uh, pleasure is really just not being in pain. Uh, so there's, there's really nothing of value to, um, there, there's nothing of intrinsic value to really help us, right? Nothing really redeems life. It's all just bad for Schopenhauer. It's just a question of how bad, really. The best it gets is when you don't exist anymore because then it's, it's, there's no badness anymore, right? And as we saw from Edwards, um, you know, if you read through Schopenhauer, which I think is sort of enjoyable in, in one way and also very gloomy in another, uh, he himself doesn't always seem exactly consistent about whether or not pleasure is something real and it's something intrinsically valuable, um, there's just not enough of it, or if it's actually sort of an illusion or, or just uh, the absence of pain and suffering. So coming back to Schlick, We've got to find meaning in something intrinsically valuable. So what might work as a candidate? Well, of course, we have feelings of pleasure, right? They're intrinsically valuable. We like those. But Schlick says, these are not going to do the trick, right? We can't find the meaning of life in feelings of pleasure. Why? Well, the way he characterizes pleasure, and so here again, you have to pay careful attention to the way Schlick is using his terms, right? Because if you misunderstand what he means by work or pleasure, or as we're going to see, play, joy, youth. Uh, if you misunderstand what he's saying or use those words differently than he does, then you're just going to talk right past him. You might try to criticize him or agree with him, but you're really not going to be saying the same thing. So for Schleck, what is pleasure? He characterizes it a few different ways. I, I've probably tried to put together a few of them here. It's shallow enjoyment. It's a diversion without depth of content. It's something that puts a false sheen on existence. Uh, so what, what is this? Well, I think, uh, you know, when I think about pleasure in the way that Schlick is describing it, I think about things like, say, eating a cookie, right? eating a tasty cookie, right? It's a kind of shallow enjoyment. It's like, it's nice, right? There's nothing wrong with it. Um, but is it, right, does it really have depth or content? Let's go back to, you know, I was talking about um, watching a certain kind of movie or, or show or something where it's just a kind of brain candy, right? It's not making me a better person. It's not making the world a better place. It's just enjoyment, right? This seems like the kind of diversion without depth or content Schlick is talking about. So feelings of pleasure are intrinsically valuable. You know, when I eat the cookie, I'm not, sort of deluding myself like, oh, this is for my health, right? No, I mean, you need the cookie because it tastes good. Uh, which, right, in of itself, Schlick's not saying like, don't, don't have fun, don't have pleasurable feelings, right? He's not saying that. Uh, they are intrinsically valuable. They're worth having. But Schlick thinks they are not going to give life meaning. Why? Because here again, we've become trapped in Schopenhauer's argument if that's how we tried to find the meaning of life. Um, we get these feelings of pleasure, Schlick says, from the fulfillment of a volition and the gratifying of a desire. But these sorts of feelings are momentary, right? Gratifying our desires, um, right? Having acts of will, trying to do something, it wears off quickly. So, you know, again, just thinking about time, uh, I eat a, say, a delicious cookie. It's a great cookie. It's wonderful. I might even think fondly back on the cookie for a short time, right? A little later, oh, that was really good. Or, you know, you have a, a good dinner or something and you think for a bit, it's like, man, that was really good. That was an awesome dinner. But 
that's probably not going to like last through your life, right? I don't look back on like a nice, really, really delicious dinner or, you know, a good cookie I had 20 years ago. Um, I think there are some slight exceptions here. I, I do think of certain meals that were particularly like, special, you know, they were on a specific trip or they were celebrating something. Um, so there are certain moments like that that I'll, I'll think back on. But when it's just feelings of pleasure, really Schluck seems to be saying these are, are sort of those low grade feelings, right? They might be like feel really great at the time, but right, they're, they're shallow, they aren't deep, they, they don't carry more to them. It's just that feeling of pleasure. Right? And our feelings come and go. And this is really what Schlick is getting at. Um, you know, when I eat the cookie, it's, it's good for a little bit, right? As I'm eating it, it's very enjoyable. Once I'm done, for the most part, the, the feeling's gone. Uh, you know, I, I enjoy watching that movie, that bit of brain candy or something, and it's nice. And then once it's gone, it's mostly gone, right? I might think back and, and have little pleasurable feelings about it or something, but, uh, these feelings of pleasure are really momentary. But our life really isn't like that. Our life um, involves constant movement and action, as he says. So we can't just look for meaning in feelings. Rather, we have to seek it in, and this is what Schlick says, he says, in activities which carry their own purpose and value within them, independently of any extraneous goals. Activities, therefore, which are not work in the philosophical sense of the word. If such activities exist, then in them and seemingly divided, uh, this, the seemingly divided is reconciled, means and end, action and consequence are fused into one. We have then found ends in themselves which are more than mere endpoints of acting and resting points of existence. And it is these alone that can take over the role of a true content to life. So it's not feelings of pleasure. We can't try to locate the meaning of life just in feelings of pleasure themselves. They come and go, they're, they're temporary, they're shallow, right? Uh, they themselves don't, in some sense, scratch that itch we have. And when I think about what Schlick says here about feelings of pleasure, I'm reminded of, of something Aristotle said uh, you know, well over 2,000 years ago in, in the Nicomachean Ethics, really analyzing what is it makes for a good life for humans, Aristotle says something very similar to, to Schluck here, and he thinks about different kinds of life, and one kind of life is really the life that pursues pleasure. And Aristotle says, uh, you know, it's, it's really just not befitting of humans to think that a life of pleasure is really the best kind of life, right? Um, Aristotle didn't quite have the notion of meaning, say, in the way that we're, we're using it here and trying to analyze it, but he did have the notion of, of good life, generally speaking. And he thought, you know, it's, there, there's something almost perverse in thinking that the best kind of life is one that's, that's just dedicated to the pursuit of pleasure, right? Just diversions, amusements, right? Um, mere games and, and idleness. Um, and here you can think, particularly, right, imagine you've got all of your material needs really taken care of, right? You've got food, you've got shelter, you've got all these things. Right, imagine you're fairly wealthy, right? How wealthy, I don't know, let's just say you have $50 million or something like that. You know, it's, I can remember being younger and thinking a million dollars seems like a lot of money. And, and now that I'm a little bit old, der, right? I'm not old, just a little older. Uh, you know, I look at a million dollars and like, yeah, that'd last a bit, right? It's not, that, that gets used up pretty quickly. But say you have $50 million, right? Um, you know, if I had that, I could expect to, well, probably just a little off the interest, but if I wanted to use the capital, I'd probably spend a million dollars a year and have a pretty good 50 years ahead, I would think. Um, so you know, if I had $50 million, or if you had $50 million, we would in some sense be freed from having to work, right? You wouldn't have to have some kind of job that you did merely um, for what it pays you, right? For the sake of other things, right? In, in schlick sense, work in the sense of something that you're doing not for its own sake, but only for what it gets you, right? You wouldn't have to have just a, a job, right? Something you had to do. So then what kind of life should you live? What would a good life or a meaningful life be? Well, what Schlick is saying here and, and what Aristotle is saying is that, you know, one kind of life you could live is just a life dedicated to the pursuit of, of pleasurable feelings, right? You just eat cookies and sit around and, and drink margaritas on the beach or something. But you don't have any activities or, or projects, right? You're just trying to feel pleasurable. 
right? Sitting in the sun, feeling good, right? Or playing childish games or something. Both Schleck and Aristotle say there's, there's really something wrong about that, wrong headed about that. I think they say it for different reasons. I'm just gonna let Aristotle drop into the picture here so we can right, maintain our focus on Schleck. But just trying to feel pleasure, right? Having that as, as you know, what you're doing with your life, they both agree there's something a little bizarre and wrong about it. Something I, I want to just put to you, and again, keeping the focus on Schleck rather than, than Aristotle, I don't want to send you a wild goose chase here. Um, you know, is Schleck right with his characterization of feelings of pleasure? Well, to really be able to answer that, I think we need to introduce his um, sense of play, which also leads us to joy. So he contrasts pleasure with joy. So rather than look for the meaning of life in pleasurable feelings, Schlick says those, those are far too temporary. They, they come and go, right? If we try to do that, again, we're gonna get trapped by Schopenhauer. What we have to do is try to find the meaning of life in play. Here again, he gives a particular definition of what he means by play, right? Which is, I, I think, certainly compatible with and certainly close to what a lot of people mean by play. You have to pay attention to what Schlick is saying about work and play when you, if you want to contrast them, uh, because you know some people when they try to engage with Schlick just totally fumble what he means, and so try to criticize him or try to say something that just like totally misses the point. So what is play for Schlick? Well, here's our definition, right? Play is any activity which takes place entirely for its own sake, independently of its effects and consequences. Right. So play is a kind of activity that's intrinsically valuable. Right? And play creates joy, not just pleasure. So pleasure is this, this fleeting feeling, this diversion with a depth of content. But Schlick contrasts that with joy. Now, he doesn't give us an exact definition of joy, but he does say that it's you know, something that sort of takes hold of us completely. Right? It, we, we find it absorbing. Um, it sets us soaring above everyday life. Um, so, you know, I've got this, this little clip art thing down in the corner, you know, a, a child with, looks like a ball and then, you know, a dog sort of running along. Uh, and Schlick play, uh, Schlick talks about youth, and we're going to come up to that in a, a moment. He says, you know, youth are really, uh, you know, young people are really the best at playing, generally speaking. And, and why is that? Because they get so torn, totally absorbed in it, right? They aren't so hung up on purposes and, and goals. They aren't so caught in this, this, you know, time the way adults often are, right? As we're doing something, we're thinking in the future, thinking in the past, when we're thinking about activities that we find, intrinsically valuable things that we find, uh, you know, pleasurable and so on. We can often be distracted by, you know, past regrets or future worries. So, you know, I can eat the cookie and it makes me feel good. Uh, stress eating is a thing, right? People will, you know, because they're stressed out about other stuff, they, they pursue a pleasurable feeling um, in the moment as a way of trying to offset that stress, right? And this can take many forms. Uh, people, you know, they can stress eat, smoke, um, stress exercise, I guess, right? Like there, there's all sorts of different habits people do in order to try to cope with, with stressors. Um, and really, what do those typically amount to? They typically amount to trying uh, to produce pleasurable feelings, even if it's artificially, right? What do I mean by artificially? If you're not just in a pleasurable state of some sort, but rather you're engaging in uh, probably some sort of, of um, product that stimulates you in the right kind of way, right? It's a kind of biological stimulation. So something similar between, I'll just use the label junk food, right? And this could be really anything, you know, anything that's not really good for you, but very pleasurable to eat, right? And the whole giant category of this, in fact, um, a lot of our grocery store square footage, um, food chain, marketing, right? All this stuff, it's, it's that kind of junk, right? It's stuff, it makes you feel good, but it's not really good for you, right? It's not good for your health. Um, there's this whole huge industry with all, all kinds of negative health ramifications, right? Um, right, and, and again, things like smoking, or we could point to uh, drug use, right? Alcohol consumption, 
these things generate these pleasurable feelings. And we, we try to do that to like, make ourselves feel good temporarily. But that's exactly what it is. It's this kind of temporary, shallow experience right, that you have, and then it feels good, it feels pleasurable, and she like says, well, you know, there's nothing wrong in and of itself with feelings of pleasure, but they really, they don't do meaning for us, right? Um, again, think, you know, if you have $50 million, what would you do with your life? One answer is just party and like drink and do drugs and like eat junk food and just, just have fun, right? Just have fun forever. Uh, I don't know about you, but I know I've, I've had long experiences of fun, right? Like big, just like party weekend or whatever, lots of fun with, with friends and enjoyment, right? Lots of feelings of pleasure and it's nice, but I just can't see leading a whole life like that, right? Um, it doesn't seem fulfilling in a certain kind of way. Uh, it doesn't seem to scratch that itch. And in fact, um, th and this is speculative, but I think well-founded in some sense. If <laughs> That's not just a contradiction in terms. It's something to be well-founded yet speculative. Uh, when you look at famous people, you know, rich, famous people, who uh, you know have have issues, uh, you know, like um, they're unhappy, right? They they mental health issues and so on. I think part of it is because they are are freed from, in a sense, the rat race of having to work and you know like get by. And, and um, once you've gotten famous or you know gotten enough money and so on, you're really free to engage in, in almost just about whatever you want. Uh, when you have that kind of freedom, it's very easy to pursue feelings of pleasure. Right, these sort of short-term feelings through, you know, alcohol or drugs or whatever it might be. Uh, but over time, it, it's really empty. It's kind of a hollow enjoyment or, or sense. Play is something different, right? Play creates joy, which Schlick characterizes as this qualitatively different kind of experience, right? Um, joy is something much more, it's much more absorbing. It's not just this shallow thing. Uh, it's not, you know, if, if you're experiencing joy, that's not the kind of state where you can uh, simultaneously, at least I don't think, Shook's not entirely clear, but this is what I'm, I'm taking from what he's saying. It doesn't seem like you can both be experiencing joy and still be stressed out. Whereas you can experience pleasure and still be stressed out. Right? You can be stressed out, like eat the cookie, and you know, have the cigarette, and like, ah, right, like, ah. And I know, you know, I, I've had those sorts of experiences. I'm all stressed out. I do things like eat the cookie or whatever, and it feels good, but I'm still stressed out and, and whatever. But when you're experiencing joy, there's just no room for that, that stress, that difficulty, that, that pain anymore, right? Or, or certainly not in the same kind of way. So joy is this, this thing that just sort of lights up our life, right? Um, it, it fills us, right? Sets us soaring above everyday life, completely engrossed, right? Like a child playing with a dog, right? Uh, there's just sort of nothing more to it. You know, think back to Schopenhauer. Uh, why do we, we love pets so much and, and animals of a certain sort? Because they're the present moment personified. They can just enjoy, you know, what exists for, for what it is. They can enjoy playing with the child and the ball for no reason beyond the experience of it. Right? That's just, they're, they're totally engrossed in it. The dog doesn't sort of stop and reflect and why do I really chase that ball all the time? Right? Why, why do I play around with the kid and, and why do we laugh and giggle? And okay, maybe dogs don't giggle, but I think they do laugh, right? Why, why do we enjoy things like that, right? They, just, they don't do that. And, and Schlick himself even says, you know, right near the start of the piece, um, when we think about something like the meaning of life, when we look to young people, there is a period of, of life before questions like this strike us, right? We're just sort of innocent about it. We, we don't step back, right? And young children typically don't step back and be like, why am I doing the things I enjoy, right? It's just not something that strikes them as a meaningful sort of question to ask. So play is really any activity we do for its own sake. Right, it's, it's intrinsically valuable. Um, and just going back for a second, uh, as Schlick says down in the, the first bullet point there, right? play is any activity which takes place entirely for its own sake. So work is something done purely for the sake of something else, it's purely instrumental. 
play is purely intrinsic, right? That's how he defines it. Now, even though play takes place entirely for its own sake, right, we do it for, you know, not for what it gets us, but just to do it, Schlick says, it's just not the case that play cannot be productive, right? So even though he defines it in a certain sort of way, right, something that takes place for its own sake, is not part of his definition of play that it cannot be productive. So a uh, couple of useful quotations on this. Schleck says, there's nothing to stop these effects of play from being of a useful or valuable kind. If they are, so much the better. The action still remains play since it already bears its own value within itself. Valuable good may pr proceed from it, just as well as from intrinsically unpleasurable activity that strives to fulfill a purpose. Play too, in other words, can be creative. Its outcome can coincide with that of work. So the same uh, a productive activity to two different people or even the same person at different times can be work or play depending on how it's experienced, depending on the motivations that go into why we're doing it, right? So if you're doing some activity, say writing, right, let's say for this course, right, you're, you're writing a, a forum post or a critical response or a final essay or something, you know, that, that writing, why are you doing it? Well, you might be doing it purely for what it gets you, right? You, oh, I don't like writing, I don't wanna do this, right? This whole course is stupid, Carl's an idiot. Again, might be very well founded. Um, you're doing it solely for, right, the course credit or the grade or however you wanna characterize that. Alternatively, you might do it purely for its own sake, right? You're just so wrapped up in this, this content, this material, and you enjoy writing and expressing yourself in a certain sort of way. And, and you go into that paper and you're like, okay, I know it's, it's gonna be graded, like whatever, uh, that's fine, right? But I've got, I've got this thing I wanna say, and I really wanna say it, and it's, it's something that you know, I wanna do for its own sake, right? And I find it really joyful to do this sort of thing. Um, Right now, and I've got to say, you know, looking back at my own work in the past, I've experienced it in both sorts of ways. Sometimes there's something to write, I just don't want to do it. Other times there's something I want to write, and I want to write it for its own sake, right? Not for what it gets me. It's, it's something I want to do just for itself. So the same activity, the same task can be experienced as work or play, depending on our own mindset and how we approach it. Um, Talking a little bit more, you know, Schlick says we can look at the work of an artist in particular as, as a good example of play, right? Um, you know, an artist who is producing art because they're, they're wrapped up in the art itself, not because they think it's going to get them fame or money or anything. Uh, or, you know, the work of a scientist pursuing a discovery or something like that, just for its own sake, not because they think it's, you know, they're not motivated by becoming famous or getting paid for it or, or having a patent or anything like that. Right, or even necessarily making the world a better place for other people, right, through discovering some new technology. But just, uh, you know, like some sort of theoretical discovery that they have no idea what kind of implications it might have, but in and of itself just seems worthwhile and interesting to them. Um, not just that, right? So he holds up the work of the scientist or the artist, at least certain forms that, that uh, um, I shouldn't use the word work, uh, activity, right, the activity of the scientist or the artist, at least um, certain forms of it. But he says, you know, it's not just that, right? He says, every true craftsman can experience in his own case, this transformation of means into an end in itself, which can take place with almost any activity and which makes the product into a work of art. It is the joy and sheer creation, the dedication to the activity, the absorption in the movement, which transforms work into play. So really for, Schlick, it's, it's about how we experience the activity that makes it work or play. And, and just about anybody can have this, right? It's not just for academics or scientists or artists or something, right? It's, it's not supposed to be this kind of aristocratic preserve for the elite. Rather, Schlick says, you know, just about anybody can have this. It's really about what gets you going. What are you interested in, right? If, if it's working on cars that just gets you totally absorbed and, and you do it and, right, you, you do it for its own sake, and hey, you happen to get paid for it too, right? You'd say, well, that still counts as play, right? Maybe it is art, or 
uh, you know, helping raise, raise children, right? Being an educator. Uh, it can be just about anything, right? Just about anything. There are some tasks that Schlick thinks uh, they really can't become play or, or it's um, very rare that it will, will become play, the, that activity itself. Uh, and so one thing I think of here, uh, which again, I, I think there's something really subjective to what Schlick is saying. So it's, I, I think we need to be pretty hesitant for when you know, we're talking about how other people experience things. I've got my experience. I've talked to many interesting individuals in my relatively short lifetime, right? many interesting students and other people. Uh, and I can certainly appreciate the plurality and, and views and motivations and enjoyments that people have. Uh, but when I think about what Schlick's talking about here, I think about like working in like a sewage plant, right? I just, there might be a certain special sort of person who, who can see that as just like enjoyable in and of itself. I think most people wouldn't want to do that if they weren't getting paid, right? That's, that's my guess. Um, but we can also think about, uh, you know, work that is in some sense designed not to be enjoyable, right? but rather to, to be efficient and productive. We can think about like sweatshop labor, right? Making articles of clothing and so on and, and doing it, right? You can make clothing in a way that can be play and it's absorbing and interesting and, and helps create joy and you can get caught up in it, right? I, I know people who sew and, and create this way, uh, it can be very rewarding, right? And that could be a, a way of, of making a living as well, right? making clothing and so on. There's a whole history of small manufacturing in the West, you know, a whole history of the world. But modern industrial production is not like that. It's very much fixated on efficiency, productivity, right, increasing output, money, profit. It, and what it does not take into account, what it does not reward or try to design itself around is making the activity of the worker a form of play or making it enjoyable. Right? Now, some work environments do do this, right? They, they consciously try to model that environment in such a way that the activities involved in the production can be a form of play. I'm not going to name any companies in particular, but you know, maybe you know of some, right? Maybe they're here in Lethbridge, or you know, you think of some in Alberta, or or you can think more globally, right? And and I think probably off the top of your head, you can come up with at least a small handful of examples of of companies or enterprises that try to make the activities involved in, in being a part of you know the enterprise enjoyable and absorbing and worth doing and, and motivating. Um, sort of in and of themselves independently of say compensation. And then you can probably think of at least a handful of examples of, of enterprises that just don't do that, right? That the activities involved in those enterprises just can't be played or can only be played to, uh, you know, certain very uh, sort of idiosyncratic people with very particular sorts of tastes. Uh, and really no thought is, is put into how best to make those activities play. Schlick says, with such occupations, I advise a very careful scrutiny of their fruits. We shall invariably find that such mechanical, brutalizing, degrading forms of work serve ultimately produce only trash and empty luxury. So away with them. Here again, a, a society focused on production, right? Focused on GDP measurements, focused on how much stuff is being produced and circulated. Really. Modern consumer culture, right, as we know it. This is exactly what Schlick is condemning. Because as soon as that is what you, you get into, right, you start focusing on purposes and goals, right? You start focusing on activities that, that aren't meaningful in and of themselves. And then so what's, what's left? Well, whatever the benefit is of those, what is it? Well, if we think about something like modern consumer culture, Right? People go out, you buy stuff, and that makes you feel good a little bit. There's a feeling of pleasure involved in buying something. But if it's just this kind of empty luxury or trash-ish, what like calls it, right? you go, you buy something, you feel good for a little bit. It's kind of like eating a cookie. Right? You get this little sort of feeling, oh, yeah, bought that thing. It's great. But then right, that wears off pretty quickly. It becomes, in some sense, part of the background of your life. Unless it's then part of an activity that really produces joy, something that's, that's gripping and engaging the veneer wears off, 
right? It, it, that, that sheen it gives to life just sort of disappears. And then you just get trapped in this kind of cycle where you, you pursue that feeling of pleasure that you get through buying something, but of course to be able to do that, you need to have money and to have the money, you have to go do some kind of paid activity, right? Which in the modern world, as, as Schlick is thinking, sort of the structural design of the whole thing, um, what we promote is work. In some sense, work for work's sake, right? So there's this, right, that whole consumer paradigm that I'm, I'm just describing is much like earlier when I was talking about, you know, how much you have to work to afford the car that you have to buy that enables you to get to work, right? There's this, this cycle to it. If you didn't have, if you didn't want to, I shouldn't say have to, because you don't have to, you don't want to buy as much stuff, right? If you were happier with less, if you had activities that you got absorbed in that were um, uh, not, you know, not free. It's not like all of our activities don't cost anything. You know, love is all you need. That's, you know, I'm too cynical for any of that kind of stuff. But, um, right, if we focus really on just what activities bring us joy, right? The things that we get really absorbed in, not just sort of stuff you buy that's artificially make yourself feel good, then in fact, you need a lot less. Right? If you focus on, in some sense, what really matters. What do we mean by that? It's what really produces joy. So Schlick thinks we need to take a good hard look at our society, societies perhaps, I should say, plural, and think about what we focus on, right, as a whole, what we encourage, right, um, what we find value in. Because a lot of it, he says, is misplaced. And this is 1927, and I think a lot of what he says is just a is applicable, if not more applicable here in 2020. So a couple of objections that Schlick raises and then answers in this piece. So first, our economy is going to shrink. We're going to produce less stuff. The GDP is going to go down, right? I, I was just saying this, right? Schlick, you know, respond, yeah, it, it does, right? Um, that's exactly what I'm saying. So if we go around and we, we look at you know, say we go through stores and you take an inventory of what's in there, right? What do we really need? What really helps produce joy, right? Rather than as just trash or luxury, right? Stuff we don't need, right? Stuff that doesn't really uh, help us lead a, a valuable, meaningful life, but rather is just kind of there, right? And it's people buy it for sort of empty pleasure and you stick it up on a shelf or whatever. Uh, you don't really use it, right? Um, Schlick says, look, when it gets right down to it, we have to think about this. Meaning is more important than the bottom line, right? Engaging in joyous activities is more important than filling your days with work for the mere end of, of making some more money so you can go on to try to make more money through more work, right? That hamster wheel of existence is not where meaning and value lie. Schopenhauer are dead right about that. So sure, our economy will shrink, but that's just the wrong way to think about these things, right? Don't engage in GDP thinking. Think about happiness and health, right? Think about the things that really matter. Second point, uh, what Schleck is advocating here will in some sense lower the level of humanity, trying to engage in those activities that bring us joy and so on, right? Is he telling us to get rid of projects and, and sort of adult concerns? Um, Aren't we, isn't he trying to drive us to be more like animals, more like the, the child playing with the dog, right? Perhaps even more like the dog, right? Schlick says, well, no, no, you know, I'm not saying, um, you know, like in, in Schopenhauer, where Schopenhauer says, look, you know, the, a pet is like the present moment personified, it's so lovely, but we just can't be like that, right? Schlick in some sense agrees, right? He's saying, look, I'm not, I'm not saying lobotomize yourself, um, right? Don't try to like make yourself like the child or the dog or something. We retain our intelligence, we retain our, our higher characteristics, our ability to look to the future and the past, to plan, engage in projects, and so on. But we can change our focus, we can change our method of living, right? What we value, what we engage in, what we do, right? Do you have to take that job you don't like because it pays a lot of money and it's really work because you don't want to do it, you wouldn't do it if you didn't need the money, but you do it for the money. Of course, you're so stressed out and frazzled from the work, you've got to spend all that money on things to sort of artificially try to make you happy to make up for the stresses and everything of the job, right? So it says, no, look, you can lead a different kind of life, right? You can uh, lead a life, and this was a pretty good segue, um, a, a, you can have a different approach to life that makes it more meaningful, 
He is not advocating that we get rid of goals and purposes and activities, well, certainly not activities entirely, right? We need goals in life, right? I, you know, you, in some sense, you can't get through life as a human without some kind of goal. But if I'm hungry and I don't have any food in the house, I need to go find some food. So presumably I need a goal of going to, you know, a grocery store or market or something and buying the food and exchanging money. For, like, we need these, right? Uh, being able to make any sort of money and all right, these sorts of things. She says, yeah, we, we need that. We do that. That in and of itself is not a bad thing. But once we've changed our, our approach, our attitude, our priorities, we will have goals but they won't dominate us, right? It's not that our goals dominate us and, and guide our life, rather we can, through our life, guide our goals. And in fact, this is where he comes around to talking about youth, the young, you know, children. And here he says, look, youth is not just, um, kind of like the, the period of being young, it's not um, just a kind of training for adulthood, and when he's talking about youth, he says it's, it's not about um, right, number of years. That's not what he's talking about. Rather, to be philosophically youthful, in this sense, is to have a certain kind of attitude right, or a certain sort of approach to things. It's to find joy in activities, not just in purposes. It's not to be dominated by purposes, but instead to... Uh, engage in activities for their own sake. So um, I'll close with, with how Schlick closes here because I, I'll just sort of read it out, um, sort of a bit of a lengthy quote here and then just talk a bit about it because I think it helps illuminate what I've been saying here. He says, if life has a meaning, it must lie in the present for only the present is real. There's no reason at all, however, why more meaning should lie in the later present in the middle or final period of life than in an earlier present in the first period, known as youth. And now let us consider what youth must, must actually mean for us in this connection. We found its true nature, not in the fact that it is a prelude in the first phase of life, but rather in that it is a time of play, the time of activity for the pleasure of acting. And we recognize that all action, even the creative action of the adult, can and must, in its perfect form, take on the same character. It becomes play, self-sufficient action that acquires its value independently of the purpose. The word youth does not have the external meaning of a specific period of life, a particular span of years. It is a state, a way of leading one's life, which basically has nothing to do with years and the number of them. It will now no longer be possible to misunderstand me when, as the heart of what I have moved to say, I assert the proposition that the meaning of life is youth. The more youth is realized in a life, the more valuable it is. And if a person dies young, However long he may have lived, his life has had meaning. So for Schlick, right, as he sums it up here, the meaning of life is youth. What, what does he mean by that? The meaning of life is really this, this certain kind of subjective mindset to be engaged in what you find uh, worth doing, right? It's, it's activity for the sake of itself. It's not being... Um, fixated by certain purposes or goals that you somehow find to be valuable for reasons outside of your own uh, enjoyment or absorption in them, right? Rather, the value of the activities is measured in the joy it produces for you. Is it absorbing? Is it the kind of thing that just sets you soaring above everyday life? Right? He says, that is, uh, you know, when it gets down to it, how can we measure our life? Well, we can try to measure it from the outside and we can try to measure it according to all sorts of different metrics, right? Length, number of years, right? We can measure it by um, income, right? How much did you make? We can measure whole country, right? Oh, how much did the whole country make? GDP and all this stuff. Which looks says, you know, it gets right down to it. It's our own experience that, that you absolutely have to um, live through, right? Like that's, that's what makes up your life. The content of your life is, is your own experiences. Joy is really this this superlative feeling this it's the ultimate good feeling that we can have to engage in play is really to generate joy for yourself so what's the meaning of life to really have a joyous life right to have an enjoyable life right it's not just mere pleasure it's not you know being stuck working toiling towards these purposes that you don't find joy in, in reaching towards but you think Definitely, right? It has to be done because it's this thing that's just so important. 
So instead, if we collectively right, reassessed what's really important and recognized what we all sort of implicitly know from the, the joy we see in children and pets and so on, and instead focused our lives on trying to increase the amount of joy in them through the activities we do just for their own sake, that is what makes a life meaningful. And it doesn't matter if you live a long time or a short time, the more joy there is in a life, the more youth is realized, as, as he says, the more valuable the life is. You know, life, you can live 100 years, but if, you're, if you spend the bulk of that time working, doing things you don't find uh, the, you know, intrinsically valuable, they aren't joyous, they, they suck your soul instead of renewing you, invigorating, setting you soaring about what you do life. What's the point, right? Why not live a third of that time? If even that, if you can spend the bulk of your time instead engaged in, in play, right? In joy, in activities you want to do. Right? And it's not just a pipe dream, Schlick is saying. What are you saying? You can, as an individual, try to organize your life in such a way that you pursue as, as best as possible this, this joy, right? This activity. Um, making your life the best it can be. Right? Will that be at the expense of money? It very well might be, right? It might be at the, at the expense of certain other sorts of things. So there is a real question about what activities you find joyous and the best way to go about that for yourself. But we can also think on a, a broader macro scale, which Slick is himself suggesting in this piece, right? We can think more broadly about how we organize our societies and whether or not we organize them to promote seeking joy and meaning through activities, right? Or have we actually set up barriers against that, right? That is a very political question, but that doesn't mean it's one that we should necessarily shrink from. So we get our short answer, which is like, what's the meaning of life? Youth, right? Meaning of life is youth, and that's really a mindset, not a time period. One thing to note here is that Schlick, really, at least not in this piece, doesn't put any limitations on this, right? Or, or any breaks, right? He doesn't, from what I see, indicate that there is a certain moral dimension or, or anything like that that limits what sorts of activities produce joy, right? Instead, it's that the youthful innocence of the child, in some sense, um, before or perhaps beyond morality. Schlick isn't quite saying this, but, but there seems to be a little bit of a subtext to it, right? Even just the omission. It's not that the, the activities are, are morally good or help the world or anything like that. Rather, it's whatever produces joy. And I believe that can change individual to individual, which is something that Schlick seems to admit as well. So we'll go ahead, wrap it up here for today. Tomorrow, we're gonna to take a look at Richard Taylor, 20th century American philosopher, who gives us an account similar to Schlick's, a little bit different, but, but similar to Schlick's. Um, and that will uh, continue our look at the subjective answer to meaning of life. Till tomorrow, I hope you're well. It's been good to talk to you, even though I don't see you. And I'll be back tomorrow, time to the table. Bye for now.